The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. There's a noise all over the place, but there's some things the saints need to know. The question is, will they hear it? Will they be sidetracked by something a larger group would say? Or will they hear what the Lord has for them? Can you hear what the Lord has for you? Or is your attention in, into everyone else that everyone else is drowning out what the Lord has given to you directly? That's something for you to think about, I hope. Because he will never fail to give you something directly. We do often fail to hear him because we desire to hear other folks and other things. We take out the balances and we begin to measure what's important to us and what's not. If the noise around us is louder than what the Lord is giving us, how can we hear him? It is a still, small voice. You know what that means? It is not the popular voice. It is not the one speaking the loudest. You have to become quiet within your own mind and heart to hear the Lord. You have to submit. The Lord's not going to raise this volume, because if he does, it will come by way of destruction. And then everybody hears it. A still, small voice is the voice of guidance. Noise would be forecasting. You guys are familiar with that. The predictions of what's going to happen in the world, correct? Sometimes that can be a lot of noise. Some of it can be true. Nevertheless, it's noise. And it should never go above what the Lord is departing to you directly. Because if it does, you can't act in the word that God gave somebody else. You must act in the word that God gave you. Because what he has for you is what you're able to perform. Everything he gives you, you are able to accomplish. You've been empowered to accomplish. When Jesus sent the disciples out into the world, it was by his strength and his power and his authority they were able to do what they did. Because when the Lord sends you, he also empowers you to complete whatever he sent you for. Every single case, every single time. I'll say it again. If the Lord sends you, he also equips you to perform everything. He has, in, he has for you everything. Anything you need, he has equipped you with. He'll provide you along the way. But he won't provide you with what you need to perform my calling or somebody else's calling. Or to act on behalf of somebody else. He's not going to prepare you nor equip you for that. He's already prepared you and will equip you for what he has for you, not for what he has for somebody else. So if you're listening to everybody else out there and you fail to hear the voice of the Lord yourself, and that comes by way of submission, because the truth is we don't know the right direction to take. But if you can surrender, and surrendering unto the Lord in that way is, is nothing more than surrendering your own self-resolve, what you think you need to do, your plans, what you have equated to truth and all these other things. If you surrender that, you'll be guided beside the still waters. He will restore your soul. He'll do it every single time. But if you don't do that, you're going to be left to your own devices. You're going to be responsible for your own solutions, getting yourself out of your own problems. I don't know about you, but I can't live that way. Can you? I think we have tried that before, and it doesn't work out too well. That's why many of us males are bald, isn't it? Then some of us get wrinkles on top of our wrinkles, which already grew on a couple of wrinkles. Correct? We don't need those things anymore. We don't need our stress to be stressed out. So if we surrender in that respect, that's honorable to say that you don't know. That is uttering a truth. How many of you know the future? How many know it precisely what's going to happen two hours from now? That will directly affect your life. I see no one. Because the truth is, we don't. Does our Father? Of course he does. Because he is the one that sets everything in motion. That permits or does not permit elements to move. So because he knows, we don't know. We should go ahead truthfully with an honorable heart and say, Lord, I don't know. Guide me. And if your heart is this way, he will never fail to guide you. It's almost like taking a ride. You don't know where it's going, but you know it's going to a good place. And you don't have to know exactly where you're going because you trust the driver. Some of you, maybe you rode a car when you were tiny. You weren't asking the driver at the age of two, why did you turn left? Why did you turn right? Why are you stopping at this stoplight? Why did you make another left-hand turn? You didn't sit there and ask all those questions, become a backseat driver at the age of two. Why? Because you trusted the driver. In this case, our father is the driver. You are the passenger. When you get to where you're going, he's going to say, go and perform a task. But make no mistake, he already has the route planned out before you. If you're called, you're qualified. If you're called and qualified, 
and you believe in Christ, you have been predestinated. That means where you end up has already been chosen. Where you're going has already been mapped out. And the Father did that for all of us. He does not make mistakes, so not one person is going to step on another person's toes, which is why unity is so important. The book of Luke. Here's why I'm going to read a portion of Luke. I'm going to read this one small part we're going to talk about. Again, the way we think of things sometimes is too worldly. It is too worldly. Number one, right now, I, I noticed last night, right, during that talk, I could see certain aspects of the chat room, and I could hear what was being said. One thing that stood out to me was this. Most of the people outside of the body of Christ, the real body of Christ. Now, the real body of Christ is not everybody you see in the church. The real body of Christ is everybody Jesus said is a part of his body. Okay, that's the body of Christ. Not what mankind says is the body of Christ, but what Jesus accepts and indeed has embraced as the body. That's the body. So the body of Christ right now can partly be seen, but part of it cannot be seen. But the real body of Christ, I've noticed something, outside of the body of Christ, there are people who look for the end times to happen all at one time. They can't seem to get the nature of timing right at all. For example, I heard last night that a certain individuals saying to a certain pastor that it's going to happen within a week. The end of the world is coming within a week. The end of the world this, the end of the world that. Well, first of all, there's not going to be an end of the world anytime soon because we have to rule and reign with Christ a thousand years. So the world is still going to continue a thousand years after Jesus returns. And before he returns, there's going to be massive suffering on the face of the earth. The earth is going to have a makeover. There'll be a destruction of this earth to a degree. And then peace will be established through Christ this time. That's going to be a time where there are few inhabitants of the earth, so societies will be rebuilt. It's hardly going to be anybody left on the face of the earth. It's not going to be a population like it is now. It'll be very different. So this end of the world, where people like to stop, they don't quite understand it. And it would be a bad thing if we didn't understand it. So I'm going to cover something tonight to help you in your way of thinking. It's all up to you, and it's all up to what the Father and the Lord reveals to you. But I want to help your way of thinking just briefly, because I've got to get back to some manual labors here, guys. I'm on the verge of completing something, and I need to get that done, and I so do appreciate everything you guys are doing. I, I really do. You have no idea. Anyway, in Luke 21, 25, I'm going to break this up in segments. It states, there should be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars, and upon the earth, distress of nations. Now, let me stop there, because we have a divide here. We have a divide that's seldom talked about. In Luke 21, 25. What do you guys see in Luke 21, 25? We're going to make this somewhat interactive by way of study. Because when this happens, you can see it yourself. You witness to it yourself. You can also see the differences. And they become very significant. So in the first part of Luke 21, 25, you see something. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. Then it says, and upon the earth, distress of nations. So you see a two-part degree here. Something that happens in the heavens. It's something that happens to the earth. But the first things happen in the heavens. Why that divide? Why make that distinction? Why say in the earth distress of nations? For what reason? You know, in the beginning, you think it's called for writing because of King James Courts, right? Wrong. That's not what that is. There are clear distinctions in the usage of this language to separate the heavens from the earth. In fact, all throughout prophecy, you see a separation of the heavens and the earth. Why? If you read carefully, you're going to find out that one implies... One thing, one sense of being, and the other implies the other sense of being. For example, often when you're talking about the heavens, you're talking about the spiritual realm, correct? In the spiritual realm, we know that God's in control. In this earthly realm, we know that kingdoms of the earth are in control, right? We have the prince of the air, that's Lucifer, that's not Jesus. The prince of this world, the king of this world, is Satan. Satan owns the kingdoms of this earth right now. That's why in Revelation, later on, after many things happen, after Jesus restores things, it says, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. That's why in the book of Daniel, it says that that last kingdom, the everlasting kingdom, will subdue and stamp into pieces all the other kingdoms. It will subdue everything on the face of the earth. But then the last fourth kingdom, the kingdom of the beast, is the fourth kingdom. The kingdom of the beast would be there for a long time, over a thousand years. Uh oh, where did I get that number from? That came from the Bible. That fourth kingdom, the fourth kingdom implies an era of leadership. 
and we live in that kingdom now, the fourth kingdom, the kingdom before the everlasting kingdom, the last kingdom. See, the fourth kingdom is the kingdom that rose up right after who? Jesus Christ came to earth and was called up to heaven. Then the fourth kingdom came. Prior to that was the third kingdom. After that was the fourth kingdom. You guys see that? So then a kingdom is a set of kingship that lasts for a specific amount of time, a long time, actually a long time. We are in that fourth kingdom where many things are taking place. The transition of man and his spirit is taking place. The everlasting kingdom is entering in. The everlasting kingdom could not be established without the coming of Christ because it was designed that way. It is first established in you. You're the citizens of the everlasting kingdom. That's why the kingdom of God is born within you. Now, if the fourth kingdom has been here for a long time, what does that tell you about the rest of the events in the Bible? They are indeed transitional. And the clock of these end times events are generational. That's why Jesus said, that generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. What generation? The generation that sees all these things. That generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. So what is a generation? A generation is an error, a gap of time. So then timing right now is not marked by the stars. It's not marked by calendars or anything else. It is marked by the nature of man. Just like the, the timing of the end times is based upon the Christian. How do I know that? Because everything is loosed. At a given time, something will happen in the body of Christ. And at that time, that man of perdition will be revealed. Once he is revealed, he will enforce his power all over the earth. It will have been in place. What is that that must be revealed first before that man of perdition? Something that must happen to the saints. That day shall not come, there shall come a falling away first, and that man of perdition be revealed. So many must fall away from the faith. Of, but has that happened yet? Or has it already been happening? According to Christ, it's already been happening. According to the apostles, it's already been taking place. See, it's not coming. We live in the kingdom where the falling away is taking place already. See, even one of the apostles said, you've heard that the Antichrist is coming. He said, the Antichrist, many Antichrists have come already. That's what he said. And that that spirit of Antichrist is in the world. So what you see is something so slow, you can't track it within one lifetime. You're going to have to look at everything within this era to see the truth of it, or you will miss it. You will proclaim nothing has happened, when in truth, you would have been born into a portion of Revelation, not being able to realize you were born in that portion of Revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ, of which John wrote, haven't you seen the layout of it? What actually happened in there? He told John, the time is at hand. The time is happening, John. He told John, John, it's already started. That's what he told John. It's already begun, John. But we don't say that, do we? See, to say the time is at hand means the time is now. But that was with John on the Isle of Patmos, surely. How can that be justified? I'll tell you how. If you look at the seals, People think the seals are coming, and they have defined for themselves what the horses are. Every time I do a study in Revelation, when I start talking about the horses, that's where lots of people, they get angry. Oh, what is he talking about? Because what I have from Revelation has not been taught by man, but is spiritual. No man taught me about Revelation. The Lord granted me that. One will either believe it, it will, it will resonate with them or not. But if you believe in man's interpretation of that to make life easier for them, then it's going to, you know, you, you won't be happy with me. What is the first horse that rode? What is the first horse? The white horse. Now, a lot of people say, yes, that's Jesus coming. How can that be Jesus coming when later on another white horse shows up with Jesus on it? No. Listen to this. This is a white horse. And he went forward to conquer. This thing was determined to conquer. He had a bow with no arrow, didn't he? What else did he have? Not only a bow, but what else? It was a white horse, what else? Come on, somebody help me out here. Anybody know? A white horse, when that seal was opened, it was a white horse. He had a bow in his hand. He had no arrow whatsoever, did he? None, zip zero. That white horse, he had a bow and a crown, didn't he? Oh, he had a crown. He had a bow and a crown. Now, let me ask you this. When you hear that, who do you think that is with a bow and a crown? Because if anybody says, I think that's Jesus, I'm going to say, who told you that? Why would Jesus open a seal and he himself pop out? Don't get the spirit of offense. We're going to narrow this down, okay? I'm going to just demonstrate something here, maybe for the first time. What the Lord has given me, he's given me. And if he gave it to me, he gave it to all of us. And if it resides within the saints, the only thing that will deny, if the Lord gave me something, is in you too. 
The only thing that would deny that is previous writings from those who try to make it popular and try to sensationalize it. So let me read it first. Can I do that? When he had opened the first seal, and I saw him behold a white whore, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given to him. Listen, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. He went forth conquering and to conquer. Did it say he subdued everything? No, it didn't. Did it say he killed anything? No, it didn't. Revelation 6.2 says, Behold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and it went forth conquering and to conquer. He had a bow in his hand, no arrow, no weapon, but the posture, the posturing of weaponry. In other words, he had a threat, but he had a crown. And who loosed this on the face of the earth? Jesus of Nazareth did. Jesus did not loose the devil. Jesus did not loose the Antichrist. These are mentioned in the Old Testament. All of them are. See, that's what people miss. If, if, do you know these horses are mentioned in the Old Testament? Anybody? Do you know what they really are? They're spirits. They're already promised to come. They're spirits, but nobody is able to do that except for the one that is hidden, that prevails, and that name is Jesus. Jesus is the only one that can loose this spirit upon the face of the earth. Now listen to this. He had a bow. He had a crown. Now this spirit getting into various people causes them to become just like this with this same posture follow me crown kingship a bow that's power but no arrow no weapons but a heart to by way of power extend the kingship all over the place do you know that same jesus also said now jesus is the one that set this loose that crown represents authority jesus said the kingdom would be against kingdom didn't he? Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. War is by nature for the authority of certain areas to extend one's kingdom, one's ways. There's a lot of posturing by way of a bow in this world right now. Not so much war itself, but posturing, yes. In fact, what do people do most of all? They stand up and show their kingship and their weapons, don't they? Can you not see that? Can you not see it's on? It went throughout the whole face of the earth. It did not go to one specific place. When these horses ride, they ride all over the earth, not just to one specific place. It must apply to everybody. He has a bow with no arrow. That is a weapon, but there's no arrow. There's no killing involved. That's posturing. He has a crown. This is the very heart of the kings of the earth. This is the spirit driving the kings of the earth. Jesus. He unloosed this seal and let this thing loose. Jesus did not let himself loose because God says no one knows when the sun is coming because God will send the sun. The angels don't know or anything else. God can only send the sun. The sun cannot send himself. So how can that be Jesus? It is not. Do you see that? I'm just introducing something. Jesus cannot send himself because the father said so. Only the father can send the son. Jesus loosens, he opens this seal, he cracks this seal, and this thing comes forward. It is not Jesus, but it must apply to the entire earth. Is this not the very mindset of all the kings of the earth? Is it not what drives their division right down to this very day? Do they not sit there with a bow and a crown on a white horse? Do you know what a white horse signifies? That is the prestige. That is the seat of royalty. Everybody could not ride a white horse. That implies something. All of these things are meaningful. And if you don't believe that, continue to read with me. And when he had opened the second seal, now I heard us, listen, a second beast say, come and see. There went out another horse that was red. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. Pause. So this next spirit, this next horse that Jesus loses, takes peace from the earth. Has there been peace on the earth? No, there hasn't. There's been no peace on this earth. In fact, when Jesus was taken up and sat at the right hand of the Father, 70 AD, when the temple fell, that's when carnage began, and it has not stopped to this very day. To take peace from the earth, Jesus was the only one worthy enough to open the seal that would loose this horse, this spirit, I'm going to call it, to take peace from the earth, all over the earth. It didn't say to take peace from Israel. It didn't say to take peace from South Africa. It didn't say to take peace from some other nation. It said take peace from the earth. So it's worldwide. So now you have two things running in the earth. They don't go back into their stables. Once he cracks a seal, you're looking at things that compound upon themselves. 
power was given to their spirit, that him that sat there on to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. Well, wouldn't you know it, during the time of the temple falling in 70 AD, carnage began all over the world. There are historical findings of war all over the face of the earth, and it has not stopped to this very day. Why all of a sudden will that begin in 70 AD? And who opened the seal? Jesus did. Why is he the only one worthy to open these seals? See, we've got to remember, Jesus said the time is at hand when he gave this to John on the Isle of Patmos a long time ago. So it took place back then, and it's been going on to this very day. The influence of this white horse is on the earth and has been in the earth for thousands of years. The red horse is the same thing. See, we forget about World War I, World War II. We forget about the civil wars. We forget about Rome. We forget about the ancient wars that people had, don't we? The carnage, how that people used to moan and groan, and you could hear it for miles in the lands before they had vehicles and everything else because they would get cut by swords and they would be infected. Nobody could heal them. We forget about the Black Plague and things of that nature, don't we? We forget about the crude weaponry that was just savage, don't we? We forget about the genocide that took place all over the earth long before they had radios and TV and vehicles and things of that sort. We have seen no peace. There has been no peace. Only The only peace that will be on this earth is that thousand year reign of Christ. There has been no peace. There's been an absolute and total degradation of things. Do you guys see that? So for someone to say, well, peace is going to be taken from the earth, that demonstrates something. That demonstrates that we cannot know. We've been alive for five minutes. And this has been going on for thousands of years. In the scheme of things, we've been alive for five minutes. Five to ten minutes. How in the world can we know what it's like 16 hours ago? We can't. We only know the small area that we have been born in. We were not exposed to what happened a long time ago in Rome. But if one would open their eyes and let the Lord speak to them, you would see that we've had no peace. And it's getting worse. And now it's even worse. We don't see the violence by way of war, because war is hidden and deadly. The same number of people that died back then died today. They had swords. We have vehicles and alcoholism. They had decrees where they would kill children so other kings would not compete. We have abortion. Can't you see it's a controlled killing? It's the same thing? It's the exact same thing going on. See, if you throw away pride out of your mind, the education from the world system, and let the Father be the expert of his word and say, Lord, show me what this means. Not what I can deduce, but show me what this means. Spiritually, he'll give you the truth by way of the Holy Spirit. And it will end up going against what you thought, because it certainly goes against what I thought. You receive from the Lord, it is not going to satisfy your flesh at all. It's going to go against everything man taught you. Because God's word is not aligned with man's word. God's word sits on its own. Man's word is seductive, crafty at best. You see the difference in the way of thinking. You know how many people really think this first horse is Jesus, as though he sent himself. Jesus does not send himself, nor does he need a bow. And Jesus does not need to wear a crown. He is crowned. Jesus did not crown himself. Jesus does not take a bow for himself. Jesus does not send himself. In that small thing, you can see something is wrong. Only the Father can send the Son. The Son does not send the Son. So this first one, well, there you go. Also, you have to read the entire book of Revelation. You can't just read a couple passages because you're going to get it wrong. You have to see the whole picture. That would be like you watching a movie. You, you go into the movie and you only watch two minutes of the movie. You come out of the movie. You don't watch the rest and tell everybody else about the movie. You're going to be wrong about the movie. You're going to misquote that one part. You might parade a villain as though it's a hero, or you might put down a villain who ends up being a good guy. You'll get it all out of context. You need the whole thing. This is how Satan works. He works in your flesh. See, where there's no flesh in the way, where there's no pride of life, driven by all these cares of this world, position in all these other things, Satan can never work in your life. If you die to your flesh daily, then the power of Satan to use you and to warp your mind and just skew what you see will go away. That's when he gets angry. He's angry at me right now for even saying what I'm saying. You don't blame me, do you? Are you watching your personal lives? How many people? Because you better not out of this unless you have been prayed up. Because if you're, uh, Satan will protect his knowledge. God does not protect his knowledge. You know why God doesn't need to protect his knowledge? Because truth is truth whether somebody believes it or not. I felt strongly about that. 
in the 80s just as I do now. Because if you jump off the Empire State Building, you can dispute gravity all day. Jump off the top of the Empire State Building is going to take effect. And you'll likely die, whether you believe it or not. That's God's word. God doesn't defend his word. Truth is true. Man defends his word. Why do you think people will argue and get angry at you to protect some doctrine? You don't do that with truth. Truth needs no defense. It's going to be truth whether anybody believes it or not. And it will also take effect whether anybody accepts it or not. But Satan protects what he has sown into the earth because he can't afford for it to fail. So when you speak something that goes against what he has sown into the earth, angry people come for you. That will never happen with the truth. You go against the truth, your Father in heaven will graciously grant you the truth. If you continue to reject it, you're going to be, you're going to pay the consequences of believing in a lie. Nevertheless, truth is not offended. If we were all in an airplane and I told you guys, listen, if you step out that door, there's nothing under your feet. Somebody may say, well, I've never heard such a thing. I'm not going to argue. I'm going to say, please, please don't step out. See, that's what truth is. You, you say, please don't step out. Just consider what I'm saying. The person steps out, well, so much for that person. Here's what a lie is. If we're all in a train and somebody sitting there said, the train is moving, nobody can leave. But the truth is, the train is not moving. You start walking to the door. They pull a gun on you and say, go sit down. I just said the train is moving. That's what Satan does. He protects his lies by threats, anger, and violence. He protects his doctrine by violence and anger and more threats. God doesn't do that. By hearing this, if you were to ever tell somebody what I just told you, they're going to fight you because it fights against their established knowledge they made unto themselves. All of us know that Jesus does not send himself. We all know this. But Satan won't like that too much because he needs people to believe that this is coming in the future. He cannot ever afford for anybody to understand it's underway. Because if it's underway, it's going to renew you in a way that you have not been renewed before. Then your Father in heaven, because you chose his truth, he's going to begin to show you his truth. And once you see that truth, you're going to be on fire. He can't afford that either. He needs you to relax, really believing that this is far off in the future. Because if you relax, he can continue to kill your brothers and your sisters. And you won't get in the way. You being the one sent to fend off the Satans will have relaxed so much that you will not be performing the very task you've been sent here to function in. So he needs you to relax in a lie. See, the Father wants us to operate in his truth, not man's truth. Man's truth is a lie. Whatever man thinks is a lie it cannot be truth. What God has decreed is the truth. What did Jesus say? That the world does not have the spirit of truth. Neither can they have it because they can't see it. They don't have the spirit of truth, so they don't have the answer for you. And what the world agrees with, how can that be the truth? There's a problem if the world agrees with it. And he opened a third seal, and I heard a third beast say, Come and see, and I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. A lot of people looked at this and said, This is economic collapse. I never, ever in my life, ever, just, I couldn't even, that was when I was a child. There was something in me about this. I've heard this before, and for some reason, as a child, I had understanding of it. I never saw economic collapse. Here we go again of something that's happening in the future. Can you see what Satan is trying to do? He's trying to make this something in the future. Had those in the past understood that these things were underway, they would not be sitting there predicting the future, but they would have been operating for the purpose of salvation of all. They wouldn't have been focused on getting everybody ready to go meet the Lord, to get out of here, to abandon everything. That wouldn't, they wasted years of their lives, turning their backs on everybody, isolating themselves in these small groups, waiting on Jesus to come get them. If they would have interpreted this the correct way, which is by the Spirit, they would have been going out, risking their lives for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because see, they would have understood that their preparation to be ready for the Lord is to be doing the work of the Lord in the earth when he comes. Remember what the Lord said? If he comes and finds a servant not giving meat and due season, that's not going to be one of his people. But if he comes and finds a servant giving meat in due season, what is that? That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is giving to one in accordance with the time. That is out there in the field being an ambassador to Christ, not packing your suitcase. You want to really be prepared? You want to really have your suitcase really packed and the right things packed? Do the will of God in the earth every day of your life. 
you will have properly prepared for his coming. Because when he comes, he wants to find you doing the will of God in the earth, not sitting in a chair or waiting on a bus stop, waiting for the bus to come. He does not want to, if he comes back and sees you doing that, there's going to be an issue. He will take all of those who are out there doing the work, who have an expectation of him every moment of the day, who are walking with him every, how can a person who's walking with Christ ever miss him when he comes? Think about that. You can't. Because if you're walking with Christ, he's in you, and you are in him. You will never miss his arrival. But when he comes, he'll find you giving meat in due season. That meat is the right word for the right time in due season. That means in the field, spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ, in the calling he's called you for, doing the will of God in the earth, not packing up everything, sitting in a corner, doing nothing, waiting for the end to come. This is not the Titanic. This is not a movie. But see, even in that mindset, has the world taught you differently than that? that? That is exactly what Jesus was speaking of. Yet the world teaches you, pack up everything, calculate the time, sit down and wait for the coming of the Lord. See, when you're waiting, you're doing nothing. To properly wait is to do the will of God in the earth. That means if you are eternal, you're not worried about death. And the work you begin now is going to continue until it comes. And when he comes, he brings his reward with him. So then all of those whom he sees working when he comes back, giving me due season. Blessed is that servant. When he comes and finds so doing, blessed is that servant. See, that's a different way of thinking in it. So much for preparations, so much for hiding in the clefts of the rocks, so much for that stuff. But if your mind is stayed upon the Lord, you're going to walk around with his confidence, not yours. And then his confidence, your confidence in him becomes your confidence, which means you can never be separated from the Lord. Listen to this. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard a beast say, Come and see. I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see that thou hurt not the oil and the wine. You know, a lot of people sit there and say, I've heard them say that's an economic lapse. The same thing I believed when I was a kid, I believe now. And it's not an economic lapse. You want me to share with you what I think this is? I've shared this before with COTNs. And a lot of people say, well, you're the only one that thinks that way. They used to chastise me. Not so much anymore. Anyway, listen. The balance is in his hand. He had balances in his hand. Look what he did. He had balances in his hand. And what did he say? A measure of wheat for a penny. And three measures of barley for a penny. You know what I see? I see a system where everything costs money. And everything has, has a set price. That's what I see. Not an economic collapse, but an economy where everything has a fixed price. Everything has a fixed price. For barley that grows naturally out of the ground, you can only obtain it by way of money. The oil and the wine which come out of the ground and can be forged out of natural things, you have to have money to obtain it. I see a system where you have to have money to obtain the natural resources of the earth. And because the balances are balances, I see a fixed system. That's what I see. I don't see an economic collapse. I see a control system. I see the resources of the earth controlled by money, not trade money. This is not trade. This is money. It's interesting that money is being used. A measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley still for a penny. All of it for what? Money. See that thou hurt not the oil and the wine. It must stay. Now if it says don't hurt the oil and the wine, don't. what do you mean don't hurt the oil and the wine? Don't corrupt it. Oh Lord, somebody's not getting it. If you're not going to hurt something, you don't corrupt it. If you corrupt it, you just hurt it. So this is not to corrupt it. I can't go any further. We're going to have to do a study on this. So everything else is corrupted by what? A control mechanism. Why is it corrupted? Because God never intended for the natural resources of the earth to be sold to one another. So what do you see here? Again, you see the same thing. Connie says, Michael, has there been an economy still Jesus? Listen, before Jesus, right? Long before Jesus, there was trade all over the place. Yes, there was money by the Romans, but God's people didn't sit around doing that. The Romans introduced the tax collection, and the Grecians didn't do anything but help that issue out. So it began to evolve then. But after 70 AD, it really happened. And everything fell under this Roman-type rule. They, they were eventually wiped away and replaced, and then the economies got even worse. Well, let's say they shifted so where they would once trade. And this happens to be the standard of all nations. In the USA, they didn't start out using money. They used trade, and it slowly turned into money. After the Great Wars, after the slaughter of the Indians, 
money was being used all over the place. Before the slaughter of the Indians, because Indians didn't want any, they didn't want, what did they need money for? They didn't want money. They began trade. They were slowly introduced into this. It's the exact same pattern everywhere on the face of the earth. Everything followed suit after Christ died, after the temple was destroyed. And guess what? God did scatter the power of the holy people all over the earth, which was to be accomplished before his second coming. See, that goes into a study of Revelation, the scattering of the holy people's power into the earth. All this goes together. But I see a fixed system here. Now, I say, but this is what I saw when I was a kid before I knew about the economy or anything else. I certainly didn't see what everybody had tried to rationalize. Because if you rationalize something, you have to have a base by which you rationalize, which means you have to take your current environment and apply it to what you're reading to make it make sense to your fleshly mind. The carnal mind is enmity against God. So if it makes sense to your carnal mind, to your mind, if it makes sense, and it's not spiritually confirmed, then it is not of God. I'm sorry. All it's going to do is give you a false confidence in the flesh that you're close to an answer, and that you'll be okay with that answer until something else is presented. That's not the way the truth works. The truth confirms deep down in your soul. There's an undeniable mechanism that says, oop, that's truth, because if it's not truth, you, it doesn't matter what people put on it. You're going to say, no, that's not it. And I'm one of those people. I'm not going to be fooled because I'm not looking for the truth of man to accommodate my flesh. I don't want anything that makes my flesh feel more comfortable. I reject it. I want things that will chastise my flesh and reveal it for what it is. Not your father's truth. There's no way God's truth is going to lift up anybody's flesh. It will destroy it because the flesh is nothing but filth. But his truth will rejuvenate the soul. It most certainly will. God most certainly will. Anyway, that's a small example of something. Uh, of something so very important that we can follow man's writings. Because haven't you noticed that man's writings change every two years? Every two years it evolves into something else. What they believed five years ago about the Bible has changed and now they believe something else. Yet, if the Lord reveals something to you as a child, it's the exact same thing today. While men are reaching and searching, trying to own, haven't we learned that whatever man understands, he tries to own it by way of controlling it. So then he fashions everything according to his own ability to control it. Haven't we? This is a natural thing within us. It's in your flesh. It's not in that newness of spirit, but it is in your flesh that whatever you have, you want absolute and total control over. And with the understanding that man has presented in the word of God, they control it. The understanding that they have, they have that type of understanding because they control it. They, they use it against people to cause guilt, shame, and it's a control mechanism. They can make people do backflips all over the place if they want to by the word of God. That is not the word of God. That's man's attempt. And believe me, its origin is by way of demonic entities working through man's flesh, perverting the word of God, calling good evil and evil good with an attempt to control somebody else. God's word does not do that. It is your flesh. It is mankind that wants to control somebody else. Haven't you noticed that when it comes to doctrine, if somebody has a doctrine out there and they cannot control you, they hate you. Haven't you noticed this? If you do right by them believing in their doctrine, they pat you on the back. That's the only way you can have peace, is to surrender to how they believe it. But if you don't believe it their way, you're an instant enemy. They hate you. They're going to talk about you and curse you. And you know what? I'm talking about those inside of the house of God. Please don't fall for those things. Your father has it set up in such a way that you are a recipient of the Holy Spirit and you can receive the truth directly. That's why he called you first out of your families. There's a reason the rest of your family does not believe like you do. Because you were the one called out of your families to actually receive the word of God. So that you would be an inspiration of somebody else. So that you, but see, you've got to be, you've got to really surrender unto the Lord. Because you know and I know that when you face your families and those people that are familiar with you, they want you to believe in a certain way and they reject what the Lord has naturally put in you. And you know I'm telling you the truth and often you bend to it. So you've got to surrender all the way and let the Lord strengthen you from the inside out that when you stand and tell his truth even when it does not agree with what they agree with you can still tell it so they can be delivered and Lord knows you guys know I'm telling you the truth you just don't discuss it and many of you have an awesome call in your life but you will never fulfill that calling if you continue to try and please your family they will never accept you for who you are so around them you have become something else you can't do that the Lord called you for who he made you to be 
And he has equipped you to complete everything he called you for. He has empowered you to go all the way in that calling. You surrender to your Lord and Savior, not to your fellow man. You're going to kill your fellow man if you surrender to him. Do you understand that? You surrender to the Lord. You can do something for that fellow man. You surrender to your fellow man, you're going to kill him. Because you will not depart to him what the Lord has placed in you. Yet, forgive me sometimes, the entire word of God to me is serious. All the time, it is serious. It is life or death every day. And it's also the greatest promise I could ever have. It is the sole doctrine I believe in. And I'm hated of many because I will not accept any other doctrines. Period. And I'm against my own flesh. You know what that means? I'll never be for anybody else's flesh, no matter what their position is. I'm totally against flesh. I can see it coming from a mile away. I can see it in operation. I can point it out. And so it hates me. My own flesh hates me. So be it. But it's under my command while I serve the Lord. I'm not under its command. When it gets hungry, I say, no, it's not time for you to eat. I'll feed you after I am spiritually done with these tasks. I don't kneel to the needs of my body. This flesh is under subjection. Yours can be too. Because if you don't place it under subjection, well, it's going to bite you every single time. Look at what it's done already. You'll find it easier to place it under subjection if you stop making excuses for it. And it's only good for this earth. It's no good for heaven. It's no good for the final kingdom, the Lord's kingdom. It's only good for this earth. And again, it takes a total surrender of self. The Lord has put the truth in you. Man does not have the truth for you. Your Father in heaven does. Man can complement the truth that's already within you, but they don't have the answer for you. I don't have the answer for you. The Lord has the answer for you. It's already in you. I can complement that truth he has put in you because it's the same truth he put in me. There is one truth from the Father, not a thousand different versions. All that comes from flesh and mankind. Notice also in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boastful, proud, blasphemous. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks. How can you be saved? If you're not willing to repent, and the Lord Jesus Christ said, Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish.